most interested particularly um, in um, the uh, value capture um, that one or two speakers have mentioned. Uh, and I'm interested to know, just up till now, uh, as we have um, in the city of Marion a, a very big uh, Westfield um, establishment, just what the uh, history or the, the mootings are, if you like, um, from those large retailers um, as to uh, how we might plan in the future. We have had um, very little exchange with them on that sort of subject, um, and I guess that does affect every council in Australia in its various ways. Uh, let me just understand the question. Was it how do you take existing operators like retailers who are there now, and how do you capture some value from them? Is that, is that the question? Well, one of the things that we've found, again, from Crossrail and from other uh, examples overseas is that once you put in a, an improved public domain, uh, values will increase. Rental values, as I think you mentioned, Bridget, rental values and property values will increase in lockstep with the degree of, of, of uh, improvement that you put and the quality that you put into the public domain. So, like many things, if you, if you want to buy cheap, if you want to go for the low cost bidder, you will get the lowest cost output. But if you put value into a project, you can actually accelerate and multiply the revenue that you get out. So in an existing situation where you've got a, a large shopping center like that, if you integrate your transport well with it, even though it's an existing user, the revenues there will go up. I believe I'm correct in saying that um, South Australia uses a property tax that's based on value. Those values will go up over time. The question is, at what point do you peg and index the current revenue stream, or maybe you need to make it retrospective, at the announcement? Now we're starting to see uh, projects generating increases in value upon their announcement. So it's very important that we think about when we implement some of these uh, mechanisms so that we capture it and then put that away for a rainy day. Thank you. There's a l oh, sorry. Well, I, was just, I was just going to, to, add to add to that question, if I might. Is this mic on? <laughs> yeah. There's, there's three components, I think, um, that you can draw on. Um, the first one is levy. Um, I, I, whilst I, there is no disagreement between myself and Joe, um, I, I do agree that um, um, an all-encompassing levy isn't necessarily value capture. Nevertheless, it can be a component of a funding package, and that was the point I was making. But uh, if you look at, uh, just look at the Melbourne City Loop, okay, a levy was placed on commercial businesses. They kicked and screamed about it, but I think the benefits have been well and truly proven. In fact, that uh, financing is just running out. The second thing is private contributions. Um, if you, as Joe said, you can demonstrate that there is a connectivity with the, the then, then the private sector will contribute. And the example there is Crossrail and Heathrow Airport, which is a, which is a um, private company which benefits from Crossrail, is making a very significant contribution to Crossrail. And the third thing is new development. And I know you, your, your Marion isn't about new, new development, but there may be new development opportunity. And again, Crossrail, I'll point to Crossrail, because one of the stations on Crossrail has been totally funded by a developer who is securing the retail, commercial, food and beverage rights um, associated with that, with, that, uh, with that transport interchange. Thanks, Taryn. There's a lady at the table just there. Dingle, I'm a resident of Norwood. Now, um, I definitely like to have a tram around down Norwood Parade um, and also, I can understand that um, if uh, if uh, the um, there is a increased densification and the buildings are higher, then you can probably get more get more rates out of them and land tax. But I am concerned about the possible social effects of some of this. For instance, the small family businesses, and if the rents go up, they might get priced out of the market and the area might lose its uh, local colour 
Um, also, if you happen to be a resident who lives near the tram line, you've got the pleasure of riding on the tram, but your house value going up doesn't actually benefit you unless you sell the house, and even then you might have to buy a new house if you simply have a higher, higher um, council rates, higher sewage rates, um, it just pay, costs more to live in exactly the same house. So I was wondering how we deal with that perhaps p potential social negative of, of the value capture. Thank you. Um, there is no doubt, and Sydney is probably the best example in Australia and some of the, and perhaps one of the best examples in the world, that when you put in transport infrastructure, it increases property values and that can drive out uh, affordable housing. What many communities across the world are doing and what Sydney is looking at now with the metro, the new metro, is making a contribution to another bit of infrastructure that's vital to the communities, and that's affordable housing. So there's a variety of models that are out there where a, a, a share of the uplift in value is dedicated to affordable housing service providers, nonprofit community housing providers, and that, that service can either be located uh, where the uh, improvement is made or it could be located somewhere else that, uh, that land values are, are less expensive. But uh, affordable housing is, is absolutely a key component. Right now we're getting maybe 2% of affordable housing in Sydney from various programs. Um, San Francisco is putting 40 to 50% in. Uh, London I think is around 30%. So we're not, we're not solving the problem, but there are mechanisms there if we can get our agencies to understand the positive impact that this investment can have on housing affordability. And I'll add to that, our experience in Sydney in terms of protecting the kind of local economy and the small business operator is that we have a lot of levers at our disposal um, through our planning instruments. So we have a fine grain policy in Sydney, which basically encourages business when it's redeveloping along the corridor to maintain those small fine grain tenancies because not only do they provide amenity, but we are then kind of enabling a little bit of protection for local business and the local economy. And we found that to be incredibly positive. I think developers get why you don't want a blank facade or a big lobby. There's a big shift in that now. And I think that's actually helping a lot of the small businesses that you might be worried might be affected, we're actually not seeing at this point them shifting. We're seeing actually a movement of that small business economy back into the city centre. Uh, with the, with um, Canberra, I'll just mention Canberra because um, I mentioned that there's the asset recycling, which is the sale of social housing along Northbourne Avenue. And anyone who's been along Northbourne Avenue will be familiar with perhaps with the social housing that exists along there on what will become uh, enormously valuable sites. Um, what I didn't mention was that uh, it's, not, it's not that the tenants are being turfed out and that the sites are being redeveloped and they're, they're being cast off into the uh, wilderness of Canberra. That's not what's happening at all. What's happening is, is as Joe said, there, there's a relocation program and in fact they're going to get much more appropriate and better housing as a consequence in, 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 a, in, a, in an area which is, a, which is not, not you know, is accessible but not just, um, it's not just about location, it's about the uh, amenity of that housing and, and it will remove the, what is a, it currently a, a very poor level of housing and a, and a ghetto standard and, and create a more vibrant um, social housing stock for Canberra. So you, you obviously need to, I think, consider these broader social impacts and design for them as part of the, the commercial and financial design and funding design of the project. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Mark, I'm CEO at Adelaide City Council. A question for Bridget, if I could, please. Um, there's a lot of local government people here today and I think um, a lot of people are really interested in how local government can really kind of influence city building. Two questions for you. Um, would the project at, 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 city, at, at Sydney have got off the ground without the City of Sydney taking a leading role? And secondly, how did you get the political support for Council to spend in excess of $200 million to make the project happen? It's an interesting question. I, it could have got off the ground 
but it probably would have taken five times as long. I think we've got a state government at the moment that are very pro-public transport and they're very um, attentive to it, but I think the work that the city put in place from a strategic point of view created the greatest enabler for the state government to come in and partner with us. So I think we made that happen. Um, sorry, Mark, your second question. Oh, how do we get the political support? Um, in a way, the council had been preparing for this for a long time and had you know, good reserves put away. We knew something had to happen. I think the leadership of Clovermore um, had basically said, we need to put our skin in the game. We can't possibly keep advocating for this unless we're prepared to be a part of the catalyst to make it happen. And it was sort of part of the whole you know, deal making that took place. And I think we were very clear though, it wasn't just necessarily funding the public transport, it was funding the extra over that increased the quality. And we could actually create our own cost plans and demonstrate where that $220 million was going. And we could see the assets that were coming back to us, parks, um, footpaths, etc. that we could actually justify that expenditure quite clearly. Thank you. I have... Sorry, uh, Councillor Wilkinson. Um, yes, Adelaide City Councillor Sandy Wilkinson. Uh, question to Jo. Um, I was very interested in the value capture and the reference that a couple of the speakers made to floor space ratios, going from two to one to four to one to six to one and actually capturing some of that increase in value. And you made a comment that here in Adelaide that um, we or government had given away the bank by basically increasing height limits and throwing plot ratio out the window. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of uh, how we could um, recapture that in order to reissue it in a way that, that um, can then be leveraged to um, fund this sort of projects? I think the, I think the way to do it is to uh, create um, precincts, transport improvement precincts. This is typically what's done overseas, that within a walkable distance of the transport improvement, you set a, um, a funding mechanism that captures the increase in value in, in some way. You might have to reintroduce a uh, floor space sales mechanism in that area, but make it an incentive. Make it an incentive to the developers where they're sharing in that uplift because every development pro forma that's ever done includes a land component in the pro forma. There's land, there's capital, there's financing, and there's uh, construction. So there is a land component in every model that needs to be added and all uh, these programs do is say, well, what is that market value? What is the developer willing to pay? What does it require to attract um, investment? And then use that as a sale mechanism. It's like selling ground or selling anything else. It's got value. Um, and then using that to fund the infrastructure and demonstrate uh, what the value uplift is as the result of the station. I mean, the bottom line is that if communities and individuals and developers don't want to pay for the infrastructure, then they shouldn't have it. There was a really good example that we saw in Dallas where there was a community that did not want to have a light rail system put in their community. Only it was a key part of the, in, uh, the, the light rail network. So the light rail authority, this happened to be an underground station, they, they built the cavern for it anyway because they thought at one point in time, at some point in time, it's gonna be needed. Well, when the, when the project opened up, that's exactly what happened. The, the developers around that proposed station came back to the light rail authority and they said, we want the station now. That is now one of the most successful stations in the, in, in the Dallas network. So the value is there, the value must be demonstrated, there will be non-believers, but I tell you what, if you go past them and you don't put a station there, uh, you're going to get a very different reaction. <laughs> uh, Bridget? Sorry, Sandy. Mark, I have to confess, I'm coming back to your question because I did get up at 4.30 and it's probably taking me 
one coffee less usually to get my brain going faster. Um, on reflection, I actually think it maybe wouldn't have happened and I think the biggest issue that we brought to the table as local government was that we had spent, the current administration since 2004, a really deep commitment to engagement and bringing the community, residential, business, community along with us. So when the Lord Mayor of Sydney really backed that project, the community really trusted. We had built up such a level of trust through the work we've done through Sustainable Sydney 2030 that I think we made it easy for the state government to get that project through. And I, I, on reflection, I think without that long engagement and commitment and listening to the stakeholders, that plan that we took forward was their plan. And we brought that to the state government and they invested in that as well. So I think, actually, on reflection, it probably wouldn't have happened. Um, Rachel. Thank you. I'm Rachel Sanderson, the state member for Adelaide. And I was a business owner at the time on North Terrace before the tramway, during the tramway and after the tram went through. So just a couple of observations that I'm interested to know if your, your tramways are the same. Um, as a business owner, we lost all of the trees out the front of our building, we lost all of the loading zones, we had extra lights, we lost all the right-hand turns. Because the tram that was put in along North Terrace was a raised tram that no traffic could use the lanes, we've got extra congestion. And also, people from North couldn't get to me because they couldn't turn right. People from Port Road, West Terrace couldn't cross over the medium strip ever. So basically, I had to survive the last year of my lease um, losing business because I was completely isolated by the tram. So I'm wondering, the tram that we have from Victoria Square further south, you can drive on the lane, you can turn right, so it doesn't have all of the issues. What type of tram lines are you building in your cities? I mean, you raise really important issues about local access, and I think every project's different, and even the project within Sydney has different components. Local access in George Street is still provided for in a shared running condition, but there's so few driveways on George Street, and to be honest, it's a walkable city. No one's driving, essentially, unless they're living um, in an apartment on George Street, or you're lucky enough to work in a building that has car parking. Um, Surrey Hills is a different situation, but again, Sydney's such a walkable city. A lot of the small business operators, they'll be affected during construction, but in the end of the day, the local access issues aren't radically changing because most of their catchment are walking to their local business. So it is, it's very site-specific to every particular project, but I think there's a way you can balance all of that. I mean, construction is a different thing, whether you're building light rail or whatever it is. But I think that is why that commitment to do the work, the planning work and the detailed analysis has to happen. So there's no sort of simple answer for that question. I don't know if my colleagues yeah. would agree. Uh, yeah, I, I do agree, Bridget. I, I, I don't think there's a simple answer. I, all I can do is give you some um, indications, some of the issues that we dealt with on, um, in Canberra. Um, Canberra's a little bit different to Adelaide because um, Canberra, of course, it, well, Adelaide's a planned city too, but um, Canberra was a very planned city. What people don't, a lot of people don't realise is that the reservations were put in place for, uh, would you believe, trolley buses um, in the original Burley Griffin design. So we're very fortunate in Canberra that there are um, reservations that run. If you go to Canberra, you'll see on Northbourne, for example, there's a very wide um, strip down the middle, which is, is the reservation for the trolley bus. But it did, does raise significant issues with trees, of course, and uh, the tree removal in Canberra is a, is a very hot political issue. And again, I think Bridget's hit the nail on the head. It's, it's communication, because in that case, uh, the, the, the trees actually might be loved by some, but they're actually dangerous. They're the wrong kinds of trees um, for, for that location. And of course, gum trees, shedding limbs, and so on. It, there, there's the public safety aspect. And getting rid of them is a positive. But it's, what, it's about what you replace them with. And so the landscaping component, and I, I, you know, I, won't, I won't repeat because Bridget did it wonderfully well with Sydney. That landscaping component and, and the, um, the way in which the, the light rail will integrate with the surrounding land and the surrounding businesses is so incredibly important to get right. I, I don't know your particular instances on North, North Terrace. Um, what I will say is we've talked about value capture. We should also acknowledge that in any construction project, particularly a linear transport project, 
there will be some losers along the way. And, and I think as part of the design, there needs to be compensation built into the construction to compensate for commercial loss as well as the value capture that we've spoken about. We have time for one last question. Gentleman over here. Hello, um, my name is Philip Purdy. Um, I work for Keolis Down, who's an operator of Yarra Trams and, uh, in the Gold Coast. And I've been in the industry, light rail industry, for 30 years. I just want to pick up a point that uh, Darren Antbridge had made, and that's about utilities. And um, it is the bane of putting in light rail is utilities. And under a PPP environment, it creates even more issues. And we've, I think they've been well recorded about what's happening in the Gold Coast, currently what's happening in Sydney, and they're going to uh, come across similar issues in Canberra. And I just want to understand you, or, get an understanding, can we do this better as an industry rather than under a PP environment or put utilities a different way? Because it affects everybody, it affects the cost of the project, it affects the community. So I'm just interested whether you feel now that you're, Richard, you're living through it now and in Canberra and Gold Coast have had lots of issues that were spoken before, is whether you feel there is a better way that we can actually manage as an industry the, uh, the utilities um, relocation? Thanks for the question. Look, I've always dreamt of a scenario similar to what Barcelona did, where they actually bundled together all the utilities into a 21st century city where you could see them, you knew where they were, and they actually isolated them into a chamber under the city. I had that dream that wouldn't it be great if the kind of um, you know, business case for the light rail in Sydney achieved that. It blows the project out of the water. And so that wasn't um, the case. I think we're working through that as best we can, but there, there must be a better way. And one would hope maybe in Adelaide, you haven't got the uh, lack of kind of clear or uncoordinated planning that cities like Sydney have, the kind of maverick organic city anyway, not planned, makes it even harder. Um, that image of the Boulevard of Trees I showed, you know, we're now really understanding the complexities of that, but we have a fantastic partnership with the state and the utility companies where everyone's bought into the vision and we're doing what we can to move the utilities out of the way. But I think it is a huge um, risk and it's a huge cost. And in a way, it'd be great if, you know, my colleagues here could figure out how you build that into the cost plan to make it easy for people like me trying to deliver these visions. Because it's a real challenge. And I think at the end of the day, we all want that outcome. But if it's not factored into the project from the outset, it's very difficult to find a way through a PPP to achieve that. Look, uh, it's an excellent question. It's, it's, I touched on it. Um, you could have a whole, as we did on Canberra, uh, whole workshops that run longer than today discussing the technical, commercial, financial implications of utilities. And I've got to say, George Street blows my mind because I, I can only imagine that utilities in, Broad, in George Street are a little bit like Brownian motion. They just pop up uh, when you least expect them because no one really knew for sure exactly what was underneath the ground there. We're a little bit more fortunate in Canberra. We do know, um, uh, we do, do have a better picture of where the utilities are. Nevertheless, you can never be sure that they're A, in the place where they're, they're said to be or B, that there aren't more utilities that have been put in and not documented. And I think the key to it on, on the risk allocation side is, and I think we're learning this and we're, 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 we're evolving from Gold Coast, Sydney Light Rail, Canberra, is that there, there is a recognition that utilities risk is not something which a government can just abrogate itself of and pass over to the private sector. Now, you know, sometimes it may not feel like that, but there is, a, there is an attempt to commercially try and put in place um, arrangements that will in, create the right incentives on, on parties to work together to try and get the best outcome with utilities relocation in particular and acknowledging what Bridget has said, you know, it would be lovely to have that utopian um, outcome of all the utilities clearly marked and down single conduits, but that's not going to happen. We can't, we've got to face the reality, it's not going to happen. So there are better ways of doing it, and it's not about simply passing the risk over. The biggest issue that we came across in, uh, in, in, um, in Canberra isn't so much perhaps locating these utilities, it, as, it, as it is actually in, in Sydney, a big issue in Sydney. It's actually the, the, what Bridget touched on. It's dealing with the often um, private sector 
in this case um, in Canberra, actually government-owned enterprises that, that run those utilities and how intransigent they can be in the dealings. And so what we did do on Canberra, which um, I think is incredibly important in this case as well in Adelaide, is, is very early engagement and discussions over utilities and utilities relocation and having a risk allocation which is a shared allocation and trying to share that risk amongst the, if it's a PPP, if it's a private sector, the private sector provider, the government and the utilities provider. And we tried very hard to get some, uh, you know, some memorandums of understanding in place, but it's amazing how difficult it is to deal with. Sometimes they're even government-owned enterprises, I've said, but how difficult it is to get them to the table. They, they can be intransigent. Nevertheless, that you know, can't be ignored. It needs to be dealt with in the governance framework. 